Welcome everyone. Today I have the pleasure of talking with one of the most well-known and well-respected dog experts in the world, Dr. Ian Dunbar. Uh, and we are going to be talking about puppy social socialization, how it's done, and also how fosters and breeders can use socialization to prevent the behavior problems that often cause dogs to be surrendered to shelters and also uh, sometimes lose their lives. So uh, welcome, Ian. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so when I try to convey the value of socialization to new puppy owners, I often share the heart-wrenching and heartwarming story that you have told about uh, your, one of your dog's final trips to the vet. And I think that story really embodies what's possible when we uh, invest a little extra in our puppies. And it's a story that I think really grips people because um, I recently shared it with a bunch of adopters uh, who then subsequently scheduled a, an appointment to take their dog, their puppy in to have a fun meet and greet with their vet. And a year later, they say the dog loves going to the vet. Um, so I think we'll save that story for the end because it's, I think it's a beautiful way to end the interview. And, um, it also, also usually makes me cry. So I think we'll save that one for the end. Well, me too, whether I can tell it or not, but that's <laughs> the end, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Good. Um, so before we get started, uh, do, would you like to introduce yourself for anybody who's living under a rock and doesn't know who you are and <laughs> also just tell um, us what you've been up to lately? Sure. Um, my name's uh, Ian Dunbar. I'm a veterinarian, animal behaviorist, and dog trainer. Um, I'm, I'm very proud about the title dog trainer because that is someone who actively changes the behavior of dogs rather than just talking about it. Um, I guess um, most of my career, well, I, I spent about 10 years at um, UC Berkeley uh, researching dog behavior, um, essentially sexual differentiation, um, all aspects of how male and female dogs develop differently. And of course, one huge aspect is social behavior, uh, hierarchies and aggression. And as I was doing this, I, I got involved with um, giving a 10 week course on dog behavior at the extension university extension for people and I loved it and I liked it more than lecturing at the university you know where students would say oh you know is that on the midterm I mean that was the level of the questions but when it's speaking to people about their dogs they were fascinated they loved it and I really found a passion there and so I've spent most of my career a um, good 50 years lecturing to owners um, dog professionals uh, veterinarians, um, dog breeders, dog trainers, uh, humane organizations, pet or pet store organizations, and so on, about behavior and training and how understanding behavior and training makes your life easier, whether you're a professional or an owner, and it makes the dog's life easier too. <clears throat> and that's about it. Now, Everything that I've pretty much that I've done in my life, every book I've written, every video I've made, uh, my UK TV program, <clears throat> hours and hours and hours of video. It's all been digitized by my son. It was a two year project he started that he called Digitizing Daddy's Brain or Daddy's Doggy Brain, I, I should hasten to say. And it's all up now on a, a single website. So it's a uh, we think it's probably the largest source of applied dog behavior that there is anywhere. Um, and what, the, so what website is that? It's called DunbarAcademy.com. And it, uh, it, it's a subscription site, but for people who, who don't want to pay a tiny subscription, we also have a free website, DogStarDaily.com. And um, that again has a wealth of organization, but it's only about, Oh, not even a tenth the size of Dunbar Academy. So that's it. Now I'm here talking to you today. And I, I saw in a recent interview with you that you are working with veterans and 
service dogs, is that right? Yeah, I now, um, well, it, March, when was it? March 2020, I got stuck down here uh, um, in San Diego and, um, and hadn't been back to Berkeley for over a year. Um, and so I started volunteering for Next Step Service Dogs that trains service dogs for um, veterans with um, uh, P PTSD and, and TBI, traumatic brain injury. And it really, it, it's funny now that I'm a volunteer after all this, um, I, I love it. It really was, uh, it, it just an extremely unique group. I mean, I've obviously lectured at loads of them in my career around the country, and, and most will sort of train a cookie cutter dog for a person, and there's very little per training of the person to sort of transfer the dog's training to them, and very little follow up. And what I loved about this group is the person's in training on site for about six months minimum training together with a dog that has been specifically trained for their needs. You know, it may be they need to be woken from seizures or need to be told when to take their meds or just to be there for them to um, like keep people at bay, you know, and, and give them a break. Um, and, but the follow-up is amazing and it's like a village. And so I've got to know a lot of these veterans now, and some are, are good friends, obviously professionally, um, I help them with their dogs too. I'm, I'm not just a, a volunteer. Obviously I help the training director completely redesign the training program. So it's, it's really quick and effective. And um, in, in the world of dogs helping people, you know, with uh, dogs for the blind and the deaf and, uh, people with physical and, and mental handicaps and, 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 and needs and what have you. I've never seen a group of such highly trained dogs because we quantify everything. So we lure, reward, train, and then we quantify everything the dog does, like all quantity, what's the response reliability on a sit stay uh, with verbal commands only, a single verbal command only. So we have fun and we play these quantification games. And now actually we're playing with the, the, the veterans to get together informally. Uh, there's a private dog park here, huge one. And so we have these little mini events and I sort of resurrected the canine games. So we play all sorts of games to really keep the training up to par, like, you know, doggy dashes. So each dog races against another dog and the winning dog goes through to the next round and all sorts of fun games. And so I just, I really enjoy it. And um, the rest of the time I'm writing a new book, which is really taking a lot of time. It's like nothing I've ever written before. Actually like no other dog book on the market. Um, so it's going to be fulfill a niche, uh, a niche of one book. And so I'm, I'm just thoroughly enjoying it. And it's essentially what I've learned from animals, you know, growing up on a farm as a veterinarian with uh, patients, uh, as a dog trainer, behaviorist, um, what they have taught me about changing behavior um, and modifying temperament. And so, and I was just writing right when my alarm went off that, whoa, I'm on with Diane, I've got to, you know, and I was writing about how my original research was all about numbers, you know, um, timing, say, dog sniffing urine and, and running statistics, coming up with p-values, or do we have a significant preference here or not? And then I read this book called Sirius, and, um, I'll, I'll read a short quote from it now, and it changed my entire research program when I realized that we live in the same world as dogs, but they perceive it entirely differently, and they have needs and feelings, and, and that's what I was missing in my research, and what tra trainers and me but knowledge dogs had needs and feelings, you know, the whole pull, push, squish, squash, what have you. So I read this little quote, and it says, 
And so I'm, I, I'm running numbers on sniffing dog urine, right? And then statistics, and I read this quote, but it's the smell that enthralls one, the maddening, stinging, sweet smell that soaks right through your body so that you can't think of anything else day or night. I thought, I think I'm missing something about dog sniffing here, you know? And so then I, I sort of invoked the dog's point of view with everything I did. And of course, the big thing that came out of this was the Open Poor Shelter Behaviour Program, uh, which um, we developed um, along the same time as the Shelter Medicine Program. And, and we you know, were, were really working with them as they were working with us because there were many rules and regulations that prevented what we considered were basic mental health um, requirements for dogs in shelters. I mean, a lot of shelters, the dog's in a cage and that's it. And so we, we wrote down these uh, this series of shelter um, behavior requirements that for example, the, a kenneled adult dog has to be out of his kennel 20 minutes a day off leash and be greeted and handled by at least 20 people, five of them unfamiliar. Just as for example, they need four toilet breaks a day to go to a toilet and to eliminate on cue. So now of course the cages don't need to be cleaned. So this, this was just a wonderful program and there are now, you know, a, a few, but a number of shelters around the country that will run an open port program or open port like program. So your, your listeners can, can access it. What is it? Openport.org, I guess. It's one of them anyway, it's not com, so it's probably .org. So open as in O-P-E-N-P-A-W, open poor, like the, the doggy equivalent of open handed. So anyway, um, sorry, I'm going on too long. You've got questions for me. I know you're sitting there with your eyes closed. And no, no, not at all. No, I, I'm squinty. <laughs> okay. Um, no, that's great. I remember you talking about the open paw program and I always thought that sounded fantastic. Um, but I'm sure for a lot of shelters, it's a, it's a tough transition to make since they're pretty much always hair on fire. It was designed with a shelter that had no money. It had a really crummy, dirty, ugly, little facility. Um, the staff were not very well educated and it became the most vibrant doggy place in the whole city of Berkeley. Uh, we got uh, hundreds of volunteers and all the volunteers, when they would come, they would bring cakes and drinks and food and we'd have picnics and while doing the like the open pool level four was off leash so I built off leash enclosures for them and it was a vibrant place because you don't need <clears throat> a budget when you have a program run by volunteers you see most shelters will go they, we've got to have a behaviorist on staff well that costs money but more importantly it's one person you can't do it you need a minimum of 300 volunteers. And we like to set a goal that the, during daytime, the dog was out of its cage 50% of the time. And people could come and see the dogs at work, whether on leash, learning, walking on leash, uh, polite greetings, or both, both greeting people and greeting dogs. So, you know, I, I find a lot of people um, in the sheltering world will, will say, oh, poor us, we don't have the money, we don't have the time. Well, of course you have the time because the dogs are crapping all over the cages and you've got to clean them. I mean, that's six hours a day right there. So you have a little house training program run by volunteers. Now you've got empty dogs in cages. So how often do you clean your cage? Well, I would say the same frequency that you clean your kitchen floor once a week, right? <laughs> you know, or between a cage residents. So I, I found um, getting the program going, it was difficult in every shelter because the number of yes buts they would give us, why they couldn't implement this program, usually coming from the board, you know, not from the staff. The staff wanted the program and embraced it, but, oh, we can't do this. Oh, no, 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 it'd be too risky. You know, we could get sued. And well, I said, look, 
you get sued for existing. This is America for heaven's sake. You don't have to do anything to be liable to be, liable to be sued. You could have adopted a dog out 10 years ago and it just killed a hamster now and you'll get sued or bitten a child, you know? And the whole point is we've got to expose these dogs to lots and lots of people. So when someone adopts them, they know what they're getting. Anyway, we're off track here. Back to the next No worries. Now, I'm not going to say a word until you ask me another question. Sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. So you've been in the dog game for a while now. So yeah. over the years, what trends have you seen with regard to behavior problems in dogs? Why do you think we're seeing these trends? What And what are the consequences? And, and the reason I ask is I have read that the number one reason dogs are surrendered to shelters and the number one cause of death in dogs under three years old are behavior problems. So, what, yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I ran statistics years ago when I, I, I created the, well, probably it's the first shelter behavior program ever at San Francisco SBCA. And um, behavior problems were, weren't considered a problem at all until I ran my statistics and did surrender questionnaires, for example, you know, why are you surrendering the dog? Oh, we're moving or, you know, not enough time or, and whatever they said, I had another question to ask. See, in the surrender questionnaire, why are you surrendering the dog? Well, that's not the reason. And I'd work that out by a telephone hotline where we analyze what are the problems people have with their dogs. So we started, this was amazing, a free nationwide behavior hotline. And we were getting 700 calls a day. So we had enormous statistics on what problems do people have with their dogs. So I could tell you if that phone rings, I could bet you that I could answer the species and the problem and I'll give you odds and I'll make a fortune because I'm going to give you say five to one odds that when that phone rings, it's a cat litter box problem because I know 25.4% of the time the phone rings, it's a cat litter box problem. It accounts for a quarter of all behavior problems. Isn't that wild? So the way I trained up my telephone hotline people, first you're gonna learn litter box problems in cats. We trained by problem. We had a problem-based you know, um, course. And once they mastered that, they would be on the phone Tuesdays and Thursdays when we scheduled all our cat litter box problems. It said that if you have a cat litter box problem, call Tuesday or Thursday and you get your 15 minutes. So I knew what problems people had, yet when they brought them in for surrender, they had a different problem. We're moving. So I would say, you married? Yeah. Got children? Yeah. Are you taking them with you? Yeah. Well, why aren't you taking the dog? You see, that's not the problem. And until they came down to a problem that had because the dog, Okay, it was a doggy reason why they were surrendering the dog. And most likely he was too active, he didn't listen. Um, and, and so we have, you know, the first problem they say, but that's not the real problem. Yeah, behavior problems are everything. And it has certainly, it improved over time. And now it's probably at the all time best in terms of fewer people are getting problems because of the frequency now of puppy classes, which of course didn't exist prior to 81, when I taught the very first, world's first off-leash puppy socialization and training class. So things have changed, I think, with the type of training, methodological aspects of training and the training available. So back then, Training was pretty much on leash obedience drills, repetitive obedience drills, and that was it. There wasn't much in a AKC training class about behavior problems or temperament problems, which is what the owners wanted. So as soon as we started puppy classes and puppy training, and I created the whole field of pet dog training, it didn't exist until I suggested it in an article in the um, AKC Gazette in my behavior problem, the first behavior problem uh, column ever. 
I said, we now need a separate field of dog training that is not competition or obedience or working dog based, but it is companion dog based. And the syllabus is enormous. You see, because in an obedience class, we know the questions before the class. It's called your obedience exam, whether novice open or utility. Well, you know, if we had the same type of exam in veterinary science saying, well, in anatomy, the question will be the dog stifle. So there's no need to learn the six other species or any other part of their anatomy. We wouldn't know much, would we? So all of a sudden we, we offered this syllabus, which was infinite. Every aspect of behavior, temperament and training problems and the training of the basic manners. And it was all done off leash using now reward-based dog training. So I resurrected these long lost training techniques, um, mainly lure reward training, and then pure and simple weight and reward training, or all and unreward training as we called it. And then later Karen Pryor brought back shaping. Uh, so these aren't new. They were all done in the 1900s and some in the 1800s. We shaped behaviors back then. We lured behaviors. We rewarded animals, you know, with our voice, you know, and food rewards. But they'd all got lost. As soon as we put the dog on leash, there's no reason. It's so convenient just to jerk it. So how I've seen behavior and training go over the years, the revolution came in 82 when I started Sirius Puppy Class. Yeah, the same Sirius as the book that I was quoting from, named after that book. Um, and it, it, it was like a revolution that people who had trained their dogs largely by leash correction would, um, they had a lot of difficulties. They had stress saying, I feel so bad for what I've done all these years. Now I know we can train them off leash using praise and rewards. It was, it was a very like emotionally um, like charged time and training improved, I would say to the peak about 95 to 2000. Everybody now was teaching puppies and adult dogs off leash using lure reward training. And then it started to go downhill again that and why? I think because now a lot of the new trainers coming in didn't realize the benefits of reward training. And <clears throat> they began to get lost in theory, theoretical issues, you know, like the four quadrants and all this stuff, instead of we're meant to be training dogs. And you'll see this now at all the dog conferences. How many videos are there actually about training dogs? training a dog to do his first recall in the dog park. Yeah, off leash with loads of other dogs there and lots of people running around. That to me is training. And we use, these were the demos back in the nineties that say the APDT. Now I find it's theory, theory, it's about other aspects of stuff like promoting your business and ethics and, you know, and bark flowers and alternative medicine and, and nutrition. But there's very little on the syllabus about trainers training dogs and quantifying that we've trained the dog to a criterion. Because as soon as we left obedience and became companion dog training, we didn't have to, we didn't have to answer to anybody. We weren't in obedience competitions anymore. So there was no quantification. So I would say, no, the standard of training has dropped dramatically in terms of ease, speed, and effectiveness. And now a lot of people are talking about training, but I, I don't see them resolve the problem like the dog is dog-dog reactive. Resolve it now, today. I mean, I, I just did it the other day. We had, a, you know, we have it all the time here that say a client's going to get a dog but they have a resident dog at home and they're worried about it because they've just been thrown out of the dog park because it growled at another dog. So we bring them in here. Well, actually I have them stand and wait outside on leash and our dogs are playing. But our dog is a known friendly pack that's extremely tolerant of dogs that don't have dog savvy. Then we let the dog in 
and it's freaked. A lot of them panic, you know, but it only lasts one or two minutes, five minutes on, what's it doing? Playing with the other dogs again, and it's got its life back. So, and, but that only comes once I have assessed the dog and I work out its friendly quotient, which is a, a, a account of how many friendly behaviors did it put out in one minute. So I actually count this on a counter. And we're getting dogs coming here that have been banned from dog parks, banned from daycare. This was the last dog, banned from daycare and dog parks. And it's showing me a friendly quotient well over 60. That's one a second, you know? But they, they can't read the dog behavior because the dog's barking and growling. And this dog barked nonstop. So once we got him playing, I said, right, we're gonna do something very difficult. It was an Aussie. You're now gonna teach him to play quietly. Do you know how long it took? Five minutes. This dog went from <laughs> That's how it played, and now playing quietly. And, you know, I'm not seeing this anymore. And it, it's a shame. And it's especially a shame when a dog's in a shelter trying to be readopted, they should give this dog a three day brain makeover, a brain and behavior makeover. So he's, a, he's infinitely more adoptable and he's got the human savvy skills to get out of there. He knows how to get adopted. I mean, one of the things we trained dogs in open for was to look cute not only to stop barking and to sit if anyone approaches your kennel, to do it automatically. So these are barkless kennels, which is very weird. Anyone who approaches the dogs, all the dogs sit and shush, but also to cock their head to one side and go and lift a paw, they're gonna get out of there that day. So we gave them these skills to, to act cute. But we also gave them living skills, manners, on leash and off leash manners. So anyway, it's really changed. So I've seen it go up. I experienced the rise. And I think I was in part responsible for this tremendous um, revolution. But now I see it, it just, it's, it's, it's upsetting. It's depressing. Sometimes I think, well, what in the hell did I do in 50 years? I saw it become a tremendous field, and now I've seen it turn into a boring, time-consuming, theoretical field. Um, are, you, uh, are you familiar with uh, Dr. Gail Watkins of Avid Dog? No. She's a, um, she's a breeder and a trainer, and she has some training, uh, puppy socialization training videos, and in one of her webinars, she talked about how she's been talking with a lot of dog professionals. And she said, even though these puppies are coming from responsible breeders that do all the right things, try to handle them, introduce them to people, um, the homeowner or the pet owners were trying to do all of the right things, but she and these other trainers were seeing an increase in behavior problems, even though socialization was, in, was going up, was more common. Uh, and she had about four reasons she thought that that was, um, it was uh, not allowing the uh, encounters to be voluntary, uh, stopping too soon and not getting them socialized during the adolescent uh, phases. And um, um, let me, let me just not making sure they're positive experiences so yeah. have you run into any of that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is really interesting how you present the view that people are not doing all the right things. I mean, no, and even less so now than in the 90s. Let's just go and go to say 20 puppy classes and check them out and ask me this question. In how many of the classes are the dogs off leash for 55 minutes of the hour? Uh, the answer is next to zero. Cla puppy classes aren't off leash now, they used to be. And, and it is so difficult to classically condition a dog on leash because being on leash will magnify every social behavior there is <clears throat> about 40 fold. I mean, this is an experiment done years ago. If you put a fence between two animals or you restrain one of them, 
what happens to social behaviors? Well, both friendly and antisocial behaviors increase 40 fold. So you've created this enormous problem. The first thing I do here is let the dog off leash. Once I have made up my mind, it is safe. And, and sometimes I get evidence it's safe because they come in and says, oh, the dogs had three fights. Any damage done? No. Cool. I did one last weekend. Oh dear, we uh, met these people and um, I actually took them out for sushi because now we can go out and eat and it's fantastic, you know. And the dog had been involved. Oh, they, that's it. They've got a new puppy, <clears throat> which is now seven months old. <clears throat> and we, we knew them before and we said, let us know. We'll show you how to handle it. No, now they're worried. The adult dog is beating up on the young puppy and they're driving in the wedge. They're not together. So I explained what to do. I said, just bring it here. Um, it was one session. That's all. Now, they're back together and playing again. And I showed them the signs. What's going on here, you know? But I knew now this adult dog had absolutely wonderful bite inhibition because he'd attacked the puppy three times and there's no damage. There's no damage. And actually when we started, the dog, you know, got into a fight with one of our dogs. But it was just, it's, it's no different than two random people meeting on a flight and they start to talk politics or religion. They're gonna get into a vibrant argument, you know? And so dogs having arguments, that's pretty normal. Even dogs being physical with arguments, it's no different than a human grabbing. Now think sibling, spouse, children. How many times have we grabbed another person in disagreement and maybe anger? Yet how many times do we send someone to hospital the, the, interestingly, when I do the surveys in my seminars, because I, I know the, the data from dogs, and it's one in a hundred dogs, you know, actually puts a person, biting dogs, actually puts, sends a person to hospital. One in a hundred. And the same frequency is for people. Out of my seminar attendees, only one out of a hundred has put someone in hospital because they've hurt them so badly. And um, so, no, no one's doing the right stuff. When you tell me breeders are doing all the right stuff, you're kidding me, all right? How are they uh, doing the neonatal handling? I bet they're gonna say, oh, we, we do ENS. Oh, come on, let's get real. Do you know what ENS is? Five exercises, each one is two to five seconds long once a day get real. That is 10 to 25 seconds of stimulation a day. That ain't going to do it. No wonder it didn't work. There's no evidence to show it worked at all, but it's the right idea. No, every wake sleep cycle, you, when the puppy wakes up, um, you let mum lick the anal genital area, so it pees and poops, and you pick it up and you do the handling. You know, lay it down, supine, lay it down, prone, pick it up, hold it by under the front leg so it dangles, waggle it, blow in its face so it can sniff you, and then handle every subliminal bite trigger on its body. Its little closed ears, its neck region, the muzzle, be careful if it don't let it sniff your neck, it'll glom on and you'll have a hickey, like a snail's walk down your neck, you know, sucking blood. I mean, they have a powerful suck, little neonates. Then it's little pores in the anal genital area, but hold it away, it may pee and poop again. Then hands around it, hugging it. And what better time to expose an animal to all the triggers that will cause it to bite in adulthood? You know, there's no breeder doing that. And when we talk about environmental enrichment, I think there's only one trainer on this planet where I think who's doing it right. When you see her videos, don't, you don't believe me then then video julie case is her name j-u-l-i-e-c-a-s-e -E, and say puppy videos on youtube and you'll see what real environmental enrichment is and most breeders would look at that and say oh my god that's inhumane she's stressing them no it's not she's got a kindergarten class there 
banging all sorts of instruments. The floor is covered with uh, plastic balls, crates, uh, wobbly planks, cardboard boxes, and that's how they're doing the recalls and the handling. You know, by the time these puppies are adult, everything is snoring boring, familiar. They, they aren't gonna meet anything that's unfamiliar or weird or strange or scary, you know? They have a whole life of no stress before them. You know, is the handling stressful? Yes, all unfamiliar experience is a minor stressor causing little cortisol blips. But if you handle neonates and puppies and you're doing it properly and you bring in a hundred people to do it in the kennel before they're eight weeks old, a hundred different people, you know, so no breeders aren't doing this. Owners aren't bringing a hundred people into their house to safely socialize with their puppies. Puppies are getting the short end of the stick. And what they have to show for it is lives of a lot of stress and anxiety, separation, anxiety, anxiety, meeting people. Yet they have to face their biggest nightmare every day. So yeah, I'm seeing much more of that now because in the good old days, so many more dogs were off leash. Dogs would go to so many more places. Like in England, we used to actually, when I was at college, we'd have to do a dog count. And we would walk from pub to pub. Like we'd go out in the night, we're going to say go to five pubs. And as we walk from pub to pub, we count how many dogs we see, and that's how many pints we're going to have in that pub. These days, you go to a pub, if you see a dog come in, it's a rarity. Dogs are being excluded from all aspects of public life for, for, and for no reason. I mean, come on, why shouldn't a dog be in a restaurant? It, it tell me, give me one salient reason. They say, oh, for public health reasons. What? Is this dog shitting in the pot? I mean, let's be real here. No, it is not. Do you know the risk in a restaurant? It's human fingers, human's nose. That is the risk for infection. Humans not washing their hands. When you think of zoonosis that people can catch from a dog, it's non-existent unless the dog jumps up and defecates in a pot and we eat it. But even then we're boiling it. So all the nematodes, all the worms will be dead. All the bacteria will be sterilized. So it's an absolute myth that it's a public health hazard having dogs in restaurants. It is too silly for words. Yet that's why they are excluded. Um, and we get it to this day because, you know, the service dogs have public access. Uh, we have a veteran once a month, we're called, they wouldn't allow us in this store, in this restaurant. And we just ring up, say, can we talk to the manager, please? And we read them the ADI regulation and say, if you don't want to face a colossal lawsuit, you write a letter to apologize and welcome them back. The dog has public access everywhere the public is allowed. And even in hospitals, not included, of course, in um, you know, operating theaters, because the public isn't included in that either. But they're going to the hospital, absolutely. Going to the hospital with you as a patient, absolutely. You know, and so that's why. No, we're not doing everything. And these are one chapter in my book. Well, the book is called Barking Up the Wrong Tree. We're doing all this stuff and convinced ourselves we're training the dog, but we're actually not training the dog. So. Well, and you were the <laughs> So much first... for that question. <laughs> uh, you were the first person, I think, who... <clears throat> advocated early socialization of puppies as a way to prevent behavior problems. I had never heard that before. I had been volunteering in humane societies for a decade at that point. I'd been in 4-H, I'd gone to horseback riding camp, I had a bachelor's degree in zoology, I owned a dog walking business, I had read I don't know how many different books, and it wasn't until I went to one of your seminars that I actually learned that this was possible and and you know I I was going to ask this question later but um it, when you said it it was like a light bulb went off and I said okay so you're telling me that we can have a permanent positive impact on their future temperament with 
and with less effort than is possible at any other point in their life, and I get to play with puppies, I, I was I was blown away by this, and I couldn't believe that everybody wasn't doing this, and particularly in shelters, because they're basically inoculating these puppies against being returned, coming back to it's the a, shelter. Yeah, it's a behavior vaccination. It's a behavior inoculation. Right. Um, and so are there any shelters that are encouraging socialization in their foster programs that you know of? Oh, yes. I mean, number one, if you have a puppy, it shouldn't be in the shelter. It should be with foster parents. And I mean, it's why, you know, the open poor shelters and others like them. I mean, there's shelters that don't run an open poor program. So I think that is the name of you. Silicon Valley. Humane Society uh, runs a version of uh, Open Poor. Um, uh, one in Colorado Springs, I think it is, runs a program that's so similar to Open Poor, although it wasn't based on it. So yeah, there are shelters where we have these uh, behavior requirements, not guidelines, but requirements. But you know, you heard it first from me, you say. I heard it first from my dad and my grandpa. Um, uh, I grew up on a farm and my grandfather classically conditioned all the young animals the day they were born or the day they came to us. One day old calves, uh, and here I'm including uh, cats and dogs, um, calves, uh, piglets, um, lambs, uh, foals, um, even the chickens. And years later when I was then a veterinarian and a behaviorist, I asked him, you know, when we got calves, one day old calves, he would invite the village kids up to teach them to drink from a bucket because they've been pulled away from mum. There's no convenient teats. They got to, you know, eat now out of a bucket. And it was mayhem, you know, you'd be covered in milk formula and the calves are licking it off. And I asked my grandpa, I said, wouldn't it have been more efficient and effective if you had the farm workers do that? And he said, I wanted the animal's first exposure to children to be a pleasant one. Because, you know, we have public footpaths through our farm. You could have a family walk through a herd of cows or, you know, where's a horse, you know? And he wanted to make sure that the animals were friendly to people. And I thought, wow, you know, and he left school when he was 12. He, he knew what classical conditioning and progressive desensitization and, and operant conditioning was before, but he had never heard the words before or the acronyms, we have so many acronyms now. So another time in my life, I actually researched, I went to the AKC Kennel Club Library in Manhattan. I spent a week there going through all their old books published in you know, 1700s, 1800s, looking up training. And that's where I found the reward training, shaping, all and unreward training. Um, auto shaping techniques, you know, all the things we do now, but under different names, they were being done back then. So no, I was not the first, and first person to suggest this. I was lucky enough to grow up doing it. And then when I was at vet college, I took a year off in my preclinical years to do a special honors bachelor's and it was actually uh, physiology of reproduction but you had one week to research a topic of your choice and I researched brain and behavior development of young animals why in the course of you know the year going through the library stacks I had come across two articles that really piqued my interest one by Michael Fox about socialization of puppies massive articles he wrote, and one by um, Marion Diamond, Mark Rosenzweig, and Bennett was the third researcher, about how early experience or environmental enrichment changes brain anatomy. And so I, when I decided I didn't want to be a practicing vet because I didn't want to stay in one place. I want to travel. Decided I wanted to do research. I thought, well, what shall I do? Well, I loved obstetrics. Um, I love behavior. So I thought, I know, sexual behavior. Tossed a coin between cows and dogs. It came down dogs. And I wrote to Michael Fox, where can I study sexual behavior of dogs near San Francisco? Why? 
this was the end of the 60s. I've been in London through the 60s. The only place to go in the world would be San Francisco, right? For the 70s. So he said, Dr. Beach, he's at Berkeley. So I wrote to him, he wrote back, come along. I can pay you this money as a research assistant and you can do a PhD program when you're here. And I thought, wow, at Berkeley, that's where the Marion Diamond study is. So I got to be a voluntary research assistant too on the Marion Diamond study. And recently I- And that was the up, Beagles? The no, no, uh, Dr. Beach was the behavior study of sexual differences. And the Diamond study was how enriching environment changes brain anatomy, increases the number of dendritic spines, bigger synapses, quicker synapses, and so on. You know, it, within three weeks, okay, an enriched environment changes brain anatomy and it's reversible. If you don't use your senses or those parts of your brain, it reverses within three weeks. It's exactly like working out your muscles. You get buff in three weeks and then you get floppy in three weeks. Well, recently I, re I read more recent studies on this. It happens instantaneously in real time. When you enrich an experience or a dog has an experience, you talk to a dog and you go, Hello, doggy, boo, 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 poof, ha, or do anything. The dendrites in the doggy's brain go, Ooh, and they plug in. You now have these dendritic spines moving and making a new synaptic connection real time. This to me is mind boggling. And so when I say the words like environmental enrichment, socialization, they haven't a remote idea what I'm talking about. I'm talking about environmental enrichment. The dog is two feet above the floor because of the metal cans and crinkly paper and wraps and planks that's on the floor. And the smells, here we have an olfactorium. There's little tin boxes with holes in and there's cat poop in one and pizza in the other and cheese and a pheasant, you know and the dog can exercise all its senses. It senses a balance plus play. That's where the dogs are playing and learning doggy savvy. That's what puppies need. And they're not even remotely getting it. They need to be handled every day. To me, when how can we produce a dog that we have to take it to the vet to be anesthetized to have its teeth cleaned or its nails? I mean, come on. You raised an animal, you breeder, you owner, and you can't clean its ears, clean its teeth, or cut its nails. I mean, it is, it's beyond the pale. And in the book I'm writing, have we been barking up the wrong tree for a long time? Convincing ourselves we're breeders, convincing ourselves that purebred dogs are better than mixed breeds or dogs and shelters. I am sorry, no, I, when someone says we have a pet quality dog, that's the biggest accolade you could pin on his collar. I'm pet quality, that means I'm cool around the crazy things that people do and the crazy things that unsocialized dogs do. Wow, there's no better accolade. But I think people, they talk the talk. They say, I'm a purebred dog breeder. I'm a trainer, but look what they're producing. If the equivalent were a car, it would be, we buy a car and it doesn't have any brakes, but it doesn't matter because the engine doesn't start and it has no wheels. That's what we're trying to sell to the public now. It, it, it's fearful, it's, you know, it's, oh, it, it's heartbreaking. And I've spent 50 years doing this. I've worked with every profession. I've explained it every which way, but loose. So now in a very positive frame of mind, this book is gonna be very positive because I just wanna let rip, you know, like Peter Finch in Network and say, I'm not gonna take it anymore. You know, I don't know whether you know this movie. He's a newscaster and he flips one day and goes and screams it. What is wrong with you world? And that's how I feel about dog professionals. And then sadly, dog owners, they get all the blame. 
How dare you use a term like irresponsible dog ownership? Did you tell them what to do? No, because you don't know what to do and you're not doing it yourself. You know, you're gonna say now, hey Ian, why don't you tell us what you really think about the dog world? As Leon Whitney wrote, what was it? The Truth About Dogs, one of Leon Whitney's books, one of my heroes, by the way. And he was a drinking buddy with Dr. Frank Beach, who was my mentor. And they uh, used to breed uh, coon hounds and beagles. His book, uh, here's a classic example. He wrote The Natural Way to Train Your Dogs. What would that be, 54? And the sister volume, The Natural Way to Train Your Cats, off leash using low reward training. 54, that antedates me by 30 odd years. You know, it was all there. But I loved him because he was a good old boy, you know, bred hounds, man, you know, coon hounds and, and beagles. Yet he used, well, he wrote a book, Dog Psychology and the Basis of Dog Training. These are wonderful books. When they came out, they were so before their time. Why? Because they were so old that it was all new again. You know, we had for, for 70 years, we forgot about rewards and psychology and the dog's needs and feelings in training. We just, when the military method came out in 1901, 1903, it all went on leash. And the only education was the leash jerk. And somehow the dogs got trained. It was amazing how resilient and creative these dogs were. I mean, if I were a dog, I'm sorry, I, I wouldn't have, certainly wouldn't have been a lab or a golden. I would say, quit this now as some breeds did, and then they were labeled as untrainable. <laughs> yeah, because you're being a jerk around them, you know. Anyway, moving along, next question. Yeah. Well, so what, how would you describe socialization to somebody who's not familiar with it? What does it mean to socialize a puppy? Uh, and what's happening, um, what's happening physiologically when we socialize them? And why does this affect their behavior later as adults? Well, physiologically, it, it changes their brain anatomy. What are we doing in the process of socialization or enriched environment? You're thinking about everything, every stimulus that this dog could encounter as an adult, and you're throwing it all at them in puppyhood. And the easiest time to throw it at them is prior to when their avoidance behaviors click in at about five months. So if you do it prior to eight weeks, you can throw anything at them and you're not gonna freak them. You know, when to expose it, say, to loud noises. I'd say when they're two weeks old, their ears are still closed. You know, when to expose them to sudden movements. I would say before three weeks of age, when they're neonates, when their eyes are closed you know, but they can smell and feel, so lots of handling then as well. And so, you know, we've got a dog here that is, this is actually a dog in training and at nine months old, freaked on the stairs, freaked when it saw me. I mean, the, 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 you know, it was in the evening, it wouldn't lie down at night, it just wanted to climb up into our laps. And we have a rule in the evenings, it's all dogs in one room with us when we're reading or watching the telly and two of you are on the couch, the rest are on dog beds on the floor. And this dog wouldn't settle down. And anyway, so in the end I put him on leash and I put my foot on the leash, not fun thing to do, but he's screaming and barking and I, I want to read. Anyway, in the morning, wouldn't come anywhere close to me. Uh, couldn't get up the stairs and when he got up the stairs, he couldn't get down. This is a nine month old dog. It, it's ridiculous, you know, and that's when I say environmental enrichment is everything. And if you can't bring it into this room, get tapes of it, get videos of it. But you need at least 100 people. And each one brings a noisemaker. Each one does weird stuff. You go a tissue, they all fall over. You've got to expose puppies to this. I would guarantee, say, if you went to um, walk down, went to a dog park, and you started going, ah, 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 and you fell on the ground, you would have nearly every dog would run up to you and three of them would bite you. It's, you know, th these things happen, you know? We gotta, so everything that would be unfamiliar in adulthood, 
you make it the snoring, boring, familiar of puppyhood. And why does this affect future behavior? Because it's changing the brain. And as soon as you've changed the brain, that the familiar, the unfamiliar is no longer unfamiliar, it's familiar and not scary or stressful. Now the dog will re-expose himself to that every day. So you see the whole point of socialization is so you can continue socializing the dog as an older puppy, as an early adolescent. Why is that important? Because starting about a five months of age, now the dog will start to avoid and react towards unfamiliar stimuli. And that's why no one socializes. You know, the dog professionals, the breeders and the veterinarian looks at the pole. Oh, wow, he's actually overly confident, overly friendly. He's a puppy, you nincompoop. They're all puppies are overly confident, overly friendly. Tell me the same when he's five to eight months old. And you know, why the, is it that it changes? What, what happens when they're five, six, eight months old that we start to see those behavior behaviors come all, out? Behavior always changes. It's not, people say to me, oh, he's never done this. And I say, well, he just did. Or she's always done this. I say, well, she didn't do it just now. Behavior is always changing. It's in a state of constant flux and it changes every day. So that on any day, it's different than the day before. That's the nature of the beast called development. Behavior is changing. Why is it changing? Because the experience changed the dog's brain. It rewired the dog's brain. We now have new dendritic spines, longer dendrites, thicker axons, and bigger and more synapses. Okay, um, and so this is what happens now, selected for in dogs, many den animals, many, many mammals, is when you are born, you are universally approaching. So for, we got two types of animals, right? Precocious animals and altrical. So precocious young are up and running within the day you know, horses, foals, for example. They're a bit wobbly, but they come out and they're gonna get up within hours and then follow whatever's there. Well, what is there? Well, mum and the rest of the herd. Geese, we all know about Conrad Lorenz's geese. So we get the eggs and sit on them so they hatch, you know, and then when they hatch, we walk away and what happens, all the geese follow you and they're now imprinted on humans for life. So we've got a sensitive imprinting period. And they used to say a critical period of socialization, although from my timeline, no, it's just early animals socialize quicker. Okay. Now for dogs um, and kitties, they usually are born in a den. And for the first six weeks of their life, they only encounter litter mates so puppies and kittens here, they only encounter litter mates and mum, okay? For other canidae, when they start to come out of the den, they will encounter their litter mates, mum, and other members of the species or their pack, all right? Now, this is cool. So they're bonding with them and they know whatever they do, I should do because I'm one of them. When they get older, that would be dangerous. And so starting at about, eight weeks, they also have this tendency to avoid the unfamiliar. So we've got a strong approach tendency up here, which is gradually beginning to decrease. Starting at about eight weeks, we got a strong avoidance gradually increasing. And that's because they're naturally being a exposed to things that could actually be dangerous when they're about yeah. eight old. And the ones that didn't learn to avoid the unfamiliar were lunch. <laughs> you know, that a hyena ate you or a lion picked you off or a human, most dangerous animal on this planet, you know, shot you. And so learning this avoidance behavior after the universal approaching phase is, has a great survival value. Okay, but people don't see it. They, they talk stupid stuff like, oh, the fear, what is it, the fear imprint period. I mean, this is fallacy, it doesn't exist. Yet every breeder knows about it. It comes from a single badly done study in the 40s. 
where three of the puppies died and one was sick. I mean, it's <laughs> and on the results of this, and I read that study. There's no conclusion that you could make from this study apart from the fact it was stupid, shocking puppies, okay? Um, but the conclusion of the experiment it was, therefore, there is a fear imprint period of 49 days or in the seventh week. It's ridiculous. No, what we have is puppy will try to approach everything, even stuff that's scary or try and overcome its fear and approach. But then five, six, seven, eight months, it will now start to avoid anything unfamiliar, slippery floors, children on skateboards, children men and when we think you know a lot of dogs grow up with an adult single woman they're not seeing the children they're not seeing the men i tell everybody you know when you get a puppy you don't keep it a secret this is a time to re-stabilize and re-equilibrate your social life which is misery at the moment especially after the last year when you have a puppy a hundred people are going to come to your house in the next four weeks and they say, oh, we can't do that. It's simple. You go down a bar and say free pizza and beer for the first four guys who comes to my house tonight to socialize my puppy. You know, I had someone in puppy class who wrote me a letter two years after class. And it, what happened was when she was in class, a different guy came with her each week. And I couldn't work out the family structure here. She had a different guy each week, right? Well, two years after class, uh, oh, the last class, I, I try and work out what the family is. So I had one little boy who had three fathers. Fathers, that was difficult, but it was Berkeley, you know? And then with this woman, I said, I can't work out who these guys are. She says, oh, I don't know, they're just strangers. I said, well, how do you meet them? She said, I, I did what you said in the notes. I went to a bar. And uh, I say, who wants to come to puppy class with me and brought them along. Anyway, two years later, she writes and I had an invitation to a wedding. She said, I just want you to know, Dr. Dunbar, I married week three. <laughs> she married the guy who came to puppy class on week three. So the point, you know, one night it's four guys for pizza and beer. The next night it's six women for white wine and good conversation or vice versa, depending on what the sexual stereotypes are in your, you know, social scene. And then on Saturday, it's three children with a parent each. And then Friday nights would be uh, playing games with, uh, say, eight teenagers, you know, video games. And, you know, we're only four days out of the first week and the dog's already met 25 people and been handled by them and trained by. It's so doable, it's so much fun. And all of a sudden our social life is back. And we now have a bomb-proof adult dog to be in a few months time. It's so easy to be. But it's what I say when I say people, when we say the word socialization, people just say it glibly. They don't understand it. They're not going to do it. I once met and had someone in class says, I was actually peeing with him during the break in the men's urinal. And he looks at me and says, oh, Dr. Dunbar, I used a keeper to socialize, you know, my beagle. I'm like, you don't use one dog to socialize your dog. <laughs> you know, you need to go to at least three different puppy classes. And by the time they've got their shots, now you're going, you're driving around town, going to six different puppy, um, six different dog parks. So people don't have no idea of what exposing the dog to everything is. So we end up with dogs which are spooked by the craziest of things. And I got caught out with two of my dogs doing this. My dog Phoenix Malamute, who attended nine puppy classes every week as trainer's dog. So from the time she, I got her, she was, uh, I don't know, four and a half months old. So she only just squeezed in, but I wanted her there um, because she, you know, I rescued her from an alcoholic breeder. And anyway, um, and then when she's a year old, she spooked at the USPS man at the front door. And um, eventually I found out he'd been bitten the day before. So, and I thought, oh my word, we no longer expose dogs to people acting scared in class. We used to role play. I said, everyone get out now and pretend you're absolutely scared. <laughs> and the puppets look at this and like, what the hell's going on? 
then they run to people cautiously, then they get food treats. And that's it. Did it frighten them? Yeah, frighten the living daylights out of them, but they've got over it. That's what socialization is. And they won't react to it as adults, you know? And then the other dog was Hugo, the little dog you want me to tell the story about when he was a year old, again, extremely well socialized. You know, he lives with two dog trainers for heaven's sake. And we're walking through Calistoga um, and he spooked. And I thought, oh, oh my God, what's happened? And of course, like any owner, I'm so worried. And then I saw what spooked him. It was a statue of a man 18 inches high. Now, whether he found the statue of the man scary or he found it scary that the human was only 18 inch and made out of stone, I have no idea, but he was so spooked. And so, you know, Kelly looks at me and I look at her and I get some uh, freeze dried liver out of my pocket. I lick it, I put it on the man's nose. Well, it took him about 10 seconds to build up the courage to take it off. Second bit, third bit, problem solved. You know, we all miss things out. And I'm sorry, I didn't socialize him to tiny statues of men. It escaped the program. That's why you ask lots of people and you ask them all to bring a scary object. So back when this used to be wrote in puppy classes and I still have videos of, um, classes where everybody has to wear something strange. So of course, you know, hats, sunglasses, Ronald Reagan masks, stuff, um, clown shoes, which are two feet long. And then someone has to every, someone has to carry something weird. And then the final week, week six, you have to wear something weird, carry something weird and act weird. And I'm videoing and I forgot this was happening and flashing lights go for under the camera. It's a guy on, a little boy on roller skates that flash lights, you know, going through the poppy class. And this is what it used to be like. It was like a carnival. Now it's on leash, you're sitting in a chair, listening to the trainer lecture. Boring. How can you socialize a puppy to people if you don't let them off leash? How can you socialize them to other puppies if you don't let them off leash? We need noisemakers, you know, on and on and on. So, yeah, well, and so one of the things that I really like about your style is that you you try very hard to make it fast, easy, and fun, so that anybody can do it. Kids, adults, it. anybody. And one of the one of my goals is to encourage more people to foster because not only is it super fun and you get to play with puppies all day, but it saves lives. And so, but one of the challenges with people who might foster a puppy is they don't have tons of time to do everything they might want to do or that we, they should do. So starting at birth to eight weeks, you know, the foster period, what is the minimum that a foster caregiver could do and still have a reasonable chance of that dog growing up to be fairly stable? Well, I, I would actually tell them less is more. Most of what you do, I don't want you doing anything with this puppy. I want this puppy in your house, in a crate, chewing a chew toy. And if it's a whole litter, I want them either crated together in an X pen with chew toys or to get them ready for home individually in the crate when they get to be like six, seven, eight weeks. So for 55 minutes of the hour, I want them lying down in a crate, um, either asleep or chewing a chew toy, because this is the easiest way to transfer an auto-shaped, well-trained dog that has been auto-reinforced for lying down calmly, quietly, and stress-free. So this dog is now prepared for, uh, it'll prevent separation anxiety, it'll prevent excessive barking, it'll prevent inappropriate chewing, and it really helps um, to train the dog to go on cue, to eliminate on cue, because every hour on the hour you say, um, should we go outside? You put the dog on leash, you run outside to the dog's toilet, or you should we go to the toilet area, could be on a balcony, you know, then you stand still and say, go pee. The dog will pee within seconds and then you say good dog and give six food treats so now 
Well, at the end of this eight weeks, we have a dog that will settle down calmly, quietly, stress-free for the most part, but you can activate it for five minutes in the hour to have it go pee on cue, and then it's five or 10 minutes of play training, and then back in the crate. Every evening, I want you to devote one hour to the puppy's socialization and training, and you're gonna invite one, two, three, or four people to your house for a function. You're gonna lure them there with pizza and beer, or Chardonnay, or video games, or whatever it is. And you tell them that in subsequent weeks, bring a friend bring two friends, then bring three friends on the fourth week. And we're gonna heavy duty expose you to every unfamiliar object in the whole world because people are gonna wear something silly, bring something silly, paper hats, noisemakers, you know, it's gonna be a carnival and they're gonna have fun and the puppies grow up with this. So to actually foster or raise a really high quality rock solid socialized puppy it takes you, you gotta have someone there every hour on the hour to take it out to pee and poop until, you know, certainly when it's eight weeks old, we can now stretch that to say 75 minutes, then 90 minutes, but up to eight weeks, every hour on the hour, you've gotta have a schedule so people are time slotted, okay? Otherwise, I want the puppy lying down and quiet, but once a day, Preferably um, the best time to do it is early evening because puppies have two activity peaks, uh, morning and late afternoon, early evening. They're crepuscular. They're not like diurnal like us or nocturnal like cats. We have two activity peaks, dawn and dusk. So it's much better to do it early evening and exhaust the dog so they sleep well throughout late evening and the night. Um, and it's party time. And so, you know, it's like when people say, oh, I don't have the time. Well, you shouldn't be fostering. Or you can do it without the time, but know what to do. When you know what to do, you don't need the time, you know? Now, if uh, someone is working during the day or they, they can't be there to let them out every hour, would you recommend, I, I use uh, potty trays with pine litter indoors. They have a dog door that they can go outside as well, but I have potty trays for them at night and during the day. Would they recommend them to foster? Yes, if they would like to foster, yes. But they have to learn how to foster in the same way that we had, when we started at Open Paw, there were volunteers there. I just want to come and pet the dogs. I just want to come and walk the dogs. And the volunteers were training dogs to be crazy and unwalkable. <laughs> So we changed it, said now different type of volunteer, you have four levels. To enter level one, you have a 20 minute orientation and then you're training the dogs, but only classical conditioning and all and on reward training outside of the cage. You then can become a level two volunteer, level three, level four. So, so but you have to learn this. And how do they learn it? Well, I would have them start by everyone um, reads the books before you get your puppy, after you get your puppy. And then you wouldn't be asking me these questions, you would know them all and all the fosters would know the answers. So how do you raise a puppy if you aren't at home in the day? It states it quite clearly what to do when you're home. Have the puppy in the crate every hour on the hour, take him for a toilet break, then play train with him for 10 minutes, put him back in the crate with the new stuff Kong. What if you're not at home? Have the puppy in a long-term confinement area that has a comfy bed at one end, a water supply, a stuff Kong, and a toilet at the other end. The area should be long and thin. Why? So the puppy uh, caters to his like natural notion of wanting to defecate and urinate as far away from the bedroom as possible. So you don't want a square area, you don't want an octagonal area. All expands are designed incorrectly. They should all be designed as a long rectangle, okay, for raising puppies. And cat expands should be three stories. <laughs> you know, small, but three stories. Little pan on the bottom, playroom in the middle, bedroom at the top. That's how they naturally like it. And so for the puppies, they got the bedroom here, the toys are anchored to the floor, 
so the cons can be tied to the floor so they can't roll into the toilet. The toilet's up there. Use final substrate like um, old dirt or concrete slab or a piece of turf or all three to prepare the dog now for as an adult peeing on concrete, peering on turf or peering on dirt. Um, so all the information is in these two books that people can download for free from either dogstardaily.com along with oodles of other puppy raising articles uh, or new client articles if you're a veterinarian and what you do with the new puppy. You know, what's the advice you give the owners? You know, all, all this stuff. It's masses of free information um, also available at Dogstar Daily. We have the free, it's called the free courses collection. Okay, at Dunbar Academy. Dogstar Daily is all free. But these two books have now been available for free to the public for over 20 years. They used to be paper books and I would distribute them to every single humane society, dog rescue and veterinary clinic and pet store in Northern California. Well, in the Bay Area, but it was 720 vet clinics. And I would drive around once a month, took me a week to do the drive around and deliver them myself, boxes of books. Eventually I didn't have the time. So we started shipping boxes of books. But then the price of shipping was five times more than the price of the books. And so then technology caught up with us and we put them online at SiriusPup.com, DogstarDaily.com, JamesAndKenneth.com, uh, DunbarAcademy.com. And we tell everyone else, download these, customize them with your own Humane Society contact info. So please, uh, book courtesy of so-and-so Humane Society, please send donations to and your contact information so you can customize the first page of the book. And then you email them to every one of your clients. This, I, I, keep, I get tired of telling this to people. Email these books or put them on your own website so people can download your customized book for there for free. They've been available for 20 years for free and still Pet owners don't know about it. Veterinarians don't know about it. Even in the Bay Area, I, I periodically write a letter and say, do you know, if you work at a vet clinic in the Bay Area, you may attend serious puppy training classes for free, checkbox. You may download free books from any of our websites, customize them with your clinic name to put on your website or to email to your clients, checkbox. And the replies I get back are, no, no, no. Once a year, I have written, and now I email vet clinics telling them this. It's like the information isn't getting to prospective pet owners. That's the problem. And when it does, and this is my last ditch attempt, this book, when it does, um, prospective puppy owners will insist breeders breed puppies and raise puppies the way they want them done. Now you think about it, what does a breeder breed for? They will tell you silliness like, oh, we, we breed for temperament. Do you know how many generations with ruthless culling it would take to change a puppy's temperament genetically? 20, 20 generations with ruthless culling, okay? Um, no, we raised for temperament. I don't care what the breeding is, we can change that temperament so quickly. You know, we ask almost as quickly as we change behavior. But what they breed them for is largely confirmation or working ability. Let's be real. No one is breeding for longevity. Now, dogs have changed. It used to be they were bred to work and then bred for show, for confirmation, for looks. What percentage of dogs now are shown or work? less than 0.1 of a percent, probably less than 0.01 of a percent. Dogs now are companion animals. But what happens? Well, you get used to them, you train them, you raise them, you fall in love with them, and then they die when they're five, seven, eight. It's outrageous. It is disgusting. It is the cruelest thing ever done to dogs and dog people 
that we're breeding dogs which are dying younger and younger and younger. I just checked just the other day as I was writing about this, life expectancies for various breeds. You know, so many breeds now, you know, 10 to 12 years, it's ridiculous. Now that was the 10 to 12 years was at Newfies. I can remember staying with a Newfie breeder in Canada years ago, and I was just petting this 12 year old, um, old bitch and, you know, saying, oh, you know, what's, how is she? So oh, she's good, you know, she's showing tomorrow in um, obedience. I said, you're kidding me. She says, yeah, we just do it once a year. But um, I said, that's incredible, well done. And, so, and the guy then said, um, so's her dad, he's 14, but he wanted to go to bed early to rest up for the show tomorrow. You know, the point is now these days, Newfies are not gonna die at seven, eight, nine. We need to breed for longevity. Why? Longevity is the single easiest, but most information giving predictor of behavioral and physical health overall. So this means why what's happening is we're breeding far too few male dogs, much too young before we know their genotype. We're not breeding genotypes. When you selectively breed, you select by genotype. What genes are there? Well, you only know what genes are there in terms of health um, after the dog has lived. So it's getting close to my meeting now. I'll have to take your last question. Sure, We've, sure. Uh, have you realized, hour and 20 minutes? Good Lord. It flies. So. Um, so yeah, I guess the last question like I was saying, the story of you taking Hugo to the vet. Um, Little it, Hugo, bless his heart. It, it, it's, their dog's last day is the last thing on the mind of a puppy owner when they take them home. But when I tell them this story, I mean, you see just the, the, the realization and the sadness and also the power of the story just wash over their face. So I, if you could just one more time retell that heartstring well, tugging story about Hugo. So our dogs go to a very good vet clinic. Um, I've known them for 50 years now, and they've known that what I do, and I've lectured to the clinic staff, and um, they, they've sponsored many things I've done. So they, they've got their pretty behavior training savvy. Um, Hugo was a French bulldog, and the farthest thing from my mind was that he would die one day, even when he was six and a half years old. I, I was thoroughly enjoying this dog. He was a, a big dog in a little body. He had an amazing can-do attitude. He just, he lived with much bigger dogs, you know, an American bulldog, a 110 pound rot coon hound. And um, he thought he could do everything, you know? And he was my best demo dog. Um, once I was demoing and I, I just screwed up. I, I, I guess I wanted it to be perfect. I made a hash of it. So I asked the director whether we could delete everything I've done and do it again. I said, well, yeah, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to do it again, but use Hugo instead of Dune. As so I talked to Hugo, I said, Hugo, dad's in trouble. This is really big. This is for TV. Uh, we got to do a demo. And he took his mark and he sat there, man, like a statue. And I did this faultless, one of a kind demo. It, it was perfect. Anyway, when he was six and a half years old, he got diagnosed with lymphoma and, um, Six months later, he, he, that's all he lasted. I mean, I knew as a vet, the diagnosis, if we treat him, he may last a year. If not, it's three to six months. And he was pretty good. And we realized he was now flagging. And I took him on a walk, which turned out to be his last walk. And I always walk dogs when I know they're not long for this world in a special place. It's the only time I walk there. And Duna died just three weeks earlier. And I was wondering if Hugo could sniff his urine there. And, you know, anyway, um, next morning we wake up and, and Hugo is gone. I mean, he's physically alive, but there's nothing there. There's no Hugo. 
And so he was just miserable and couldn't move. So we rang the vet clinic and asked if we could, because the in-home vet was scheduled already for two days time, but he was full up. So we rang our clinic, said, could we bring little Hugo down? Um, he's on his last legs and he's just miserable. And they said, yeah. So we put him in the, the car and I got little Hugo on my lap, right? And um, Kelly's trying. You know, it's, it's only about a mile drive and Hugo's out and I'm sort of petting him. And then we go through this tunnel, a road tunnel at the top of Solano Avenue. As we go in the tunnel, Hugo sort of starts moving and I see his nose twitching. And before we come out of the tunnel, he's jumped up on my lap and he's like, normal again and we drive down the road to the vet clinic and had Molly and he jumps out and he runs in you know and of course I mean I'm realistic I'm a vet I know this is just and he runs to greet them and this vet clinic um I always used to tell people that Hugo knew it as you know mum and pop's treat dispensary because every time he would go in, they wouldn't just give him one dry biscuit. It would be food reward, food reward, food reward, food reward. <laughs> on the exam table, food reward. So it's like he was on his last legs. He was nearly gone. But the thought he was going to his vet clinic, you know, the land of treats where all his friends, you know, that spoiled him worked. Um, it was amazing. And when you think about it, when a dog is you're feeling miserable, you know, not even dying, but he has to go then feeling unwell to a vet clinic. And he's now in an unfamiliar, scary place and he's going to be handled, restrained by unfamiliar people. No, it's got to be the friendliest of places for your dog. So anyway, that's the Hugo story. And yeah, it's good. This is the end of it now. So I will quickly say goodbye to everyone. And I know you guys aren't here now, but you will be here in the future. And so if you've listened to this, thank you. Um, there's lots we got to do for dogs. Um, we're not doing it right yet. We're saying we're breeding them. We're saying we're raising them right. We're saying we're training them right, but we aren't. So let's look on breeding and raising and training of dogs as always trying to exceed our personal best and striving for a better way. No matter if you are doing some of these things, we can still do it better. So I'd like to end by thanking Diane. Thank you very much. Um, I was um, very honored to be invited. Um, thank you for the interview and we'll do it again, right? Oh, absolutely. I would love to. And thank you so much, Ian. This was a, a real a special opportunity for me. So thank you well, so much. Good, goody, goody. You did a good job, didn't you? I hope so. <laughs> you did a very good job. Thanks. I'm going to press two red buttons now, which is very challenging for me. I'm not not uh, button savvy, but, but thanks. And until the next time. Okay. Bye. Bye. Ian.